Hello and welcome to the Blockchain and Us, where pioneers and thought leaders talk about their journey in blockchain technology, crypto assets, and the token economy. And I'm your host, Manuel Staggers. This episode has support from no official sponsor, but from my very own The Blockchain and Us newsletter. Get an email from me every two weeks with a very short summary of new podcast episodes so you can immediately pick those interviews you'd like to listen to. To stay up to date, just visit www.theblockchainandus.com and sign up today. My guest today is Lars Thompson. Lars is a leading futurist and founder of Future Matters, who has been working with over 800 companies on strategies and business models for the future. His main focus areas are the future of energy, the future of work and mobility. Lars is also a frequent keynote speaker and a member of several think tanks and the World Future Society in Washington, D.C. And now to the interview. Hi, Lars, and many thanks for taking time today. Good morning. We spoke already several times about blockchain technology and also about digital transformation more generally. Um, today, I want to focus on blockchain technology and also related to other technologies that might have a big impact in the future. But first, in your view, what role do you think blockchain technology will play in the future? Well, I believe that blockchain will be the underlaying um, technology for um, a lot of transformations that will that we will see both in the monetary system as well as on you know society issues. Um, until now, we have seen a very inefficient way of transacting um, money, currencies, or even information. And we are on the verge of a new paradigm, how we are um, using a new technology that is now, you know, evolving uh, to reorganize quite a lot of systems that we see in the world. What kind of system? I mean, you, you spoke about financial, financial system, finance more generally, but um, you also mentioned information. So where do you see this technology play a role? In, in many spaces, we see um, that we need a more efficient way of um, dealing with data, uh, currencies, and um, even contracts. I mean, when we're talking about smart contracts, for example, when we look in, into logistics, uh, and uh, you look at the, the whole logistics chain from the first point where we are mining some uh, materials uh, until it is consumed and then recycled. Um, we have so many points that we have contracts that we need to have tax forms, that we have monetary transactions and all these things. And um, we have just analyzed one uh, basic chain just for food production, for example. And we see that there's 13 to 15 different points where you need to have a paper, whether it's a um, customs form or whether it's a um, an, an invoice or a performa invoice and all these things. And if you can just use the blockchain to um, to get rid of half of that, you would not only spare quite a lot of paper, but also time and effort. And oftentimes when we talk, for example, of, about uh, smart contracts, uh, it's all about trust that everybody is on the same page or you know, has the same information and it will um, it will increase the efficiency um, of uh, quite a lot of systems and for example logistics is just one small example of where we can um, see this technology um, bringing real benefit in the future do you often get clients who approach you with questions about what blockchain technology can do for them? It is starting. I believe that uh, the community that uh, developed the blockchain over the last years is a very close community until now. And uh, my experience at the moment is that most of our clients are very much in, uninformed about the possibilities of the blockchain. So it is used quite a lot in some keynotes and in in in, in, in talks. But if you are um, talking to, for example, executives from the banking industry or the logistics industry or any others, they know the term, but they couldn't describe what blockchain really is or the benefits of it. But it's starting to uh, become more mainstream. I mean, there's even um, 
um, conferences, or you see, you see quite a lot of conferences where blockchain is now being discussed in, in some sessions. But I think that we are still in the early stage of com commercialization. Mm -hmm. But you have lots of clients who ask you what technology can do for them in the future in their lines of business. So how important is the term blockchain technology in these conversations or or do they look more at you know other technologies to to improve their processes well the funny thing is um most of them are still talking about digitalization and i often roll my eyes and say well you know this is not the mega trend of 2018 digitalization has happened over the last 30 years that we digitalized quite a lot of things that was our last interview right right um now we're getting to the point where we see that okay we have all the data in digital form but how we are going to um use them on a um system or on on a level that we can interact and exchange this data you know whatever it is whether it's a patent application that you can store on the blockchain and it's you know proven that that that, that is there whether it's um, transferring money or um, assets or storing contracts and and now we are just beginning to realize that the next step after digitalization is both uh, on the one hand having um an under underlaying technology that helps us share this data more effectively and more securely and the other thing is that we are implying more and more artificial intelligence uh, to automate um, processes Now, we have seen automation in the uh, production of goods over the last uh, you know, 30 to 40 years. And now we are starting to automate uh, processes, um, services, um, communication. And blockchain is very important to that. But I still believe that, um, well, we probably need another two or three years before most of the executives really see the benefit of this technology in their particular space. Somebody I spoke to recently mentioned the term blockchain theater. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, he meant, you know, people want to somehow also show that they're on board with what blockchain can do right. and they understand. But they actually, the application is still a little bit fuzzy. Uh, yeah, and I would agree with that uh, statement. The... Um, Uh, I, I believe that, you know, when we are going back and we are looking at the internet um, and in the first few years after um, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web or um, Mark Andreessen uh, built its first Mosaic browser or, or you know, the first Netscape browser on that, it took probably five to six years before people could really understand what this technology could really do. You know, back then we said, yeah, last night I spent two hours surfing the internet. Um, yeah, so what? You didn't order anything from Amazon. You didn't, you know, chat in your community. All these things weren't there at the moment. So we had to play with this technology f for a little bit. And, and to be honest, even, you know, even I had problems in, in the mid, midst of the nineties to, to imagine what we could do with this platform. Um, and, uh, uh, even when Amazon started selling its first books, I couldn't imagine that, um, there are households in, in the U.S. Who, who are getting Amazon deliveries twice a day, um, for, for almost everything they, they consume in their household. So, yeah, we have to start small. We have to find some killer apps or some applications that really, um, work and, and, uh, and inspire people to, to, to go further. But to compare it with the internet, I think we've just seen the first Netscape browser when we are compared to, 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 to blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. At least there's something to compare this technology to, right? I mean, that didn't exist, exist with the internet, then it was totally new. Now, I mean, I often hear this analogy, right? We're in the year 94, in you know terms of the the internet where blockchain is today so that may help yes what yeah. about um cryptocurrencies crypto assets tokenization is that also a topic that clients of yours deal with yeah absolutely i mean uh, that has become very mainstream with the bitcoin rise and falls and you know uh, uh and it's it, it's been covered in almost 
every medium uh, now. So everybody is trying to figure out where this is going to. And I believe that, yes, um, cryptocurrencies um, are also um, a uh, in, in the very infant stage of uh, our everyday lives. Right now, they are very speculative uh, currencies. Um, I believe that there will be more than just bitcoins. I think that we will have a very, you know, technologies that are very incremental that can be used not only to, to trade, um, um, currencies like dollars or euros or something, but also, um, currencies that, um, have the same security that, that the bitcoin offered on the blockchain, but it needs to be much faster and much more scalable than we are right now. And uh, so, for example, when we are looking, and, and again, when we're looking for logistics, for example, uh, there are some truck companies right now, they are, uh, they're trying out this technology where they are platooning uh, um, trucks, which is basically the case, there's one truck breaking the wind in the front, and then there's four or five trucks just using... Um, the, the 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 lower drag behind the 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 other truck so that they use twenty to thirty percent less fuel. Now, how do you pay the first truck driver? And and you cannot pay that with a credit card. You cannot pay it with Bitcoin. But if you have like Yotas, where you can have very small fractions, and 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 you can you, you can you can make that contribution to the first driver every every mile. Um, that would be that would encourage quite a lot of efficient new ideas how we can share resources how we how we can how can we uh, 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 you know how how someone can be um, paid or valued uh, for something that he does with others and I think if 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 we are moving into a more liquid um, system where we can easily exchange. Um, yeah, some values that, 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 that are valuable for us. We will see totally new economies and new ways of, of, of using um, the blockchain and cryptocurrencies. The example that you just mentioned with the truck, platooning the trucks, is this a project that you're currently researching? Yeah, we're researching that and we are also working with companies um, on the use of c uh, cryptocurrencies and, and the blockchain in various applications. But again, right now, uh, we are helping companies finding uh, pilot projects that they can trial out. Um, we, um, we try to calculate the economic benefits um, in that. And so, for example, even when we are looking at, for example, the energy system, we are seeing that more and more people have a solar system on their roof. They have a battery that can store energy. They have an electric car. They are connected to the grid. So we have like four different um, interfaces, um, you know, towards the house, towards the car, towards the grid, uh, towards the neighbors, where we have to have a new uh, way of um um, selling this energy, storing the energy, and, and finding the right price at the right time. So, for example, when the, sh the sun is shining, the PV, uh, the, the photovoltaic system is producing too much power, so the price goes down. But if a cloud comes, the price goes up. So we have to have, and that's what we call a liquid, liquid market system. And we know that the more efficient we can... Um, Reg that, that we can use pricing as a regulative um, measure, the more efficient the market becomes. So the most efficient market is where the price drives demand or, up, or the other way around, demand drives the, the, the price. And that is the most efficient way of using scarce, res scarce resources. So for example, for energy or something. So I believe This technology is also um, bringing forward the energy revolution or the, the use of more renewable energy. Um, and this is to say that, you know, blockchain is just more than an economic tool or a, um, it is also a very important tool to save our planet in, 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 that, in that sense. When you look at the full spectrum of the technologies that you that you research on behalf of your clients, where does blockchain 
and um, blockchain technology and crypto assets, where does that fit maybe on order of importance? You know, is it one of the most important or somewhere in the middle? Oh, no, it's not. It's not even in the middle. It's it's below the middle uh, of importance. Um, what we are experiencing right now with our clients is that they are overwhelmed by the dynamics of innovation that we are facing. Um, we, we have a staccato of um, news coming into every industry, whether you're working in banking or in transport or in energy. Um, and what we are experiencing right now, they are following some mega trends. Uh, they are trying to find new business models. Um, how to compete on a global scale um, in the future, how to reorganize work or um, how leadership should uh, should function in the future. Uh, but I believe that in terms of importance, the blockchain is not the most um, obvious thing that the, that the companies see. Um, even in banking, where we would say, you know, this is pro this should be one of your top three priorities to to think about that. We experience that uh, when we're talking to executives who really have the decision power where to put efforts, talents, and money. Um, um, well, um, blockchain is not on their top three. Why not? I don't know. Probably because. We are in a stage where um, there's quite a lot of confusion uh, within established companies. They're trying to defend their old business model, and and blockchain is basically questioning um, very much uh, the essence of uh, their business model. But on the other hand, I believe that we will see players both in the banking or the insurance industry or even in the logistics that focus on blockchain technology are actually building upon blockchain technology and they will be those disruptive um, players in the market where um, we are not talking about incremental innovation where we are just adding to the existing model but where we're taking a clean sheet of paper and say okay how can we solve the the problem or the business proposition that we had uh, using a new technology base and, well, I believe it'll take another probably two or three years before we actually see new global companies working on that base. But on the other hand, I mean, we are, when, we, when I say two to three years, many will probably think, oh, this is a long time. We're talking about 100 to 150 weeks. And that's not, not a long time. Um, so by 2020, 2021, we will see blockchain-based insurers, um, blockchain-based um, um, logistic companies, blockchain-based um, providers of energy or decentralized energy t solutions. But it'll, it'll, it'll probably take another two or three years. Will those be new entrants or will those be incumbents who just reorganized? Most likely there will be new entrants. Um, we see quite a lot of activity in the startup scene uh, around blockchain. We see quite a lot of activity in venture capital and and capital allocation uh, that go into this technology. So it's easier to, to found a new company on a new paradigm than to um, try to put a new business paradigm over an old uh, incumbent. And uh, the way that the world works is that the incumbent needs to then decide whether to buy uh, the, the, the new company and, uh, or the startup or, or to uh, trust that their customers will never buy this new service or product which often is um, a good recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you said the, many of your clients see this technology or this, this cluster of technologies rank very low in order of importance. But for you personally, you know, with a 50,000 foot view, where do you see it on a scale of importance? Well, for me, um, I believe that we have quite a lot of problems that we can only solve when when we are using a new paradigm um, a, a new 
you know, yeah, a new paradigm in technology. And I would uh, order blockchain technology within my top five um, important mega trends that we are looking at right now. Um, one is that we are calling it, uh, well, one mega trend is what we often call as the end of stupidity, um, which is basically artificial intelligence helping us um, to transform uh, many aspects of our lives and businesses where we have pattern recognition, where we have self-learning systems, where we have the ability to understand complex things much faster. And then um, I, I, I probably rank number two is probably our conversion, how we are dealing with scarce resources and energy and, and, and all these things. And, and then blockchain would probably come at number three at the moment. But um, for itself, it, it is a very, um, um, well, a very important platform uh, to enable good things in the future. And I still believe that most of our biggest problems that we are facing as humans uh, for the next 50 years can easily be solved if we are just creative enough and use the technology or the tools that we, are, that we have created over the, 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 the past years. And blockchain um, will transform that. On the other hand, I see that there's quite a lot of resistance coming from old industry players that are not very fond of this new technology and because of its dis uh, disruptive nature, um, we will have quite a lot of lobbying and uh, um, forces trying to um, uh, to uh, slow down this process as far as, as much as they uh, as they can. I want to ask a few questions about your approach to to doing these consulting projects with clients. Um, let's say an, a big incumbent comes to you. So how does such a project unfold? Well, the basic question is how are we are going to earn our money in 10 years from now? Uh, who is going to pay us for what and how we are going to process, um, uh, how, how we are going to, 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 deli to, 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 to produce it, to, to deliver our products and services. Um, we are also looking at the changing of customer behavior. So, um, we see some mega trends that um, that are very easy in their essence. Um, if, we always say that uh, if you're going to, if you have a technology that enables uh, to and enables us to do something that we used to have better, cheaper, more efficiently, safer, um, well, easier. Um, then eventually, it will be adopted by quite a lot of people. So, for example. Back in history, there was a time where traveling on a horse was the most efficient way of getting around. And it took some time before we are starting to, to move away from the horse and using whatever kinds of transportation that we have today. Um, and that is what we call a tipping point. Now, in the past, we have always adopted technology that makes things easier because we strive for a more comfortable life. So when we are working with clients, we are trying to look at first levels of, um, um, of first level reasoning, how we, how we are calling it, um, to try to remodel business models, to, to rethink how you can reach customers, how you can um, find efficiencies in your processes. And yes, we are also um, putting our focus on, on, um, new paradigms like blockchain. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, this is one of a, a couple of disruptive opportunities that we are having. And uh, oftentimes then the, the actual possibilities are explored by special specialists or, or, or some uh, other consultants that go much, much deeper than we do. What are processes that you use? I mean, first is the, you know, the problem definition maybe, and then you, you come up with some ideas to explore, but what, how exactly do you go deeper there? Let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. This episode has support from no official sponsor, but from my very own, the Blockchain and Us newsletter. 
get an email from me every two weeks with a very short summary of new podcast episodes so you can immediately pick those interviews you'd like to listen to. To stay up to date, just visit www.theblockchainandus.com and sign up today. What are processes that you use? <laughs> well, most of it is common sense and it's um, most of it, When we do consulting, we, we have, um, it's hard to, to describe. First, when we are looking at a trend um, and you're just following the trend line, you're, you're basically not seeing the whole picture. What you're trying to do is to understand a bunch of trends that have interaction, that have what we call cross impacts, um, that have a uh, different dynamic than... Um, the world around us, you know, the, the most trends that really transform an industry or our lives are much faster than our normal life. So understanding the dynamics of a system is one thing and the interaction between trends and technology. The other thing is to get a deep understanding on how technology works. Um, once you know how a machine works, you can easily imagine how to improve it. And the same is true with, um, monetary systems or um, economies, you know, all these things. And the other thing is, you know, implying fantasy and intuition and creativity to think what could be possible um, when using this technology. And the funny thing is, well, we are very creative when we are young, you know, when, when you're talking about to, to a four-year-old or five-year-old, I mean, they have a great fantasy you know, to imagine things. And over time, this um, decreases. Um, and oftentimes we find it hard for managers, even engineers, to have the freedom to think the unthinkable or to, to really think new on, on, uh, on technology. So sometimes we are just encouraging people to be brave enough to imagine something that is not there yet, um, but that is not a, you know, just continuation of what we know. Um, to give you an example, I mean, even 10 years ago, if people would have said, yeah, everybody will have a smartphone, even our children, and they will have a, um, basically a TV studio built into it, and they have their own TV channel that they can reach millions if they want to with their, Uh, you know, with their videos or a podcast or, you know, whatever. Even 10 years ago, people would have said, it's that's too crazy to think. And today we think it's totally normal. Yeah, you know, you can do that. And so when we're talking about blockchain and saying, okay, you, you, you have an automated um, backbone for all your contracts, information, payment systems, and everything that you need to exchange in a secure way will be taken care of. I mean, it's just working. People coming to us and say, no, 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 no. Just look at our, uh, our office. It's full of paper. It's, you know, it's, it's a total mess. And it, it's, it's very hard for people to close the picture that they used to know and to open up a new picture of what could be in the future. And so that's the third part of our journey, and it's just enabling or encouraging people to be uh, creative and using their fantasy. What is usually an output of such a project? That differs. Um, oftentimes we are, um, we are disappointed right after a project because um, when we are working with a client, we have internally quite a lot of discussions, what we would do and what we can suggest and, and how we are going to, um, you know, build this factor map and the future map that we are working on. And, and then when we are working with clients, about 90% of that is just being, um, abandoned or, you know, the, the, the client says, no, we don't need that. And, uh, why is that? Do they um, not believe it or don't, don't well, they, they want take, to see? It takes some time to get used to new ideas. And the first reaction often is no. It's, it's, it's not very common that people say yes to every new idea, but over time, this, this idea is in your head and it de develops. 
And when we go back to clients that we have consulted like three or five years ago, it's it's amazing. You see, all, you know, even to those things that they said no to, um, they say, well, we have a new business unit that is doing just that. And, you know, it's just a great thing that we've, uh, th that we've done that. And often, often they think they, they, they even say, you know, that was our idea. Um, and <laughs> well, in the short term, we are disappointed. Um, and in the mid and long term, oftentimes you see that magic is happening. And, um, I'm, I have to get used to the fact that, um, well, if there's something new, um, you find just a very small percentage of people who are saying yes to it at the first time. But over time, once you seed an idea into one's head, it becomes, um, yeah, it, it eventually grows. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. I mean, I remember you mentioned something like this last time where you made a whole um, concept for one of your clients, how they could save, you know, 50 or 60 percent on uh, certain processes and, and they just didn't do it because it would have threatened what they're currently doing. So how do you deal with this tension between that, you know, that com incumbents often have between their current business, their current sources of revenue and potential new streams of revenue? Well, personally, I, I really have to tell you, I, I'm oftentimes when I come back directly from the, where we, what we often do is future labs where we are, taking our time two or three days and just working on on future concepts and when i get home i often tell my wife you know oh it's so frustrating um but on the other hand i have i i'm i'm right now starting to learn that um i i have to be more patient uh, with our clients the other thing is it is far more easier for a startup to um to um work with a new idea and to put their um, total focus on, on, on a new paradigm and to build from that than, to, than trying to rebuild an organization um, with a new idea. And, and that is a natural process. And I, I often compare it. If, if you're looking into um, a forest Uh, yes, they are old and big trees that um, that have been standing there for 200 years, but eventually they give way for um, new plants um, that need the light that uh, actually uh, comes and, and, and grow big again. And the chances of having a company that survives more than 50 years in business um, are only about, you know, 20%. So if you look at the history of um, companies, um, about 80% die over time. Only 20% survive a longer period than, the, than 50 years. So the odds are against uh, the incumbents, um, although we always think no. Um, but, you know, history shows it is. What about incumbents that may not see themselves as incumbents? Companies like Apple, Google, Facebook. Hmm. What about their business models? Well, that takes quite a lot of leadership. And, and I believe that as long as you have someone at the top of a company that still has the entrepreneurial spirit, who is still driven, who is still paranoid um, um, about um, uh, other companies, that drive the, drives those companies. Um, most of the incumbent companies that I would call incumbents are – led by managers and not the founders of the companies. And um, they're just looking at um, their shareholder value, their, um, uh, how, how they're going to make the quarter, and they don't have the vision anymore. Oftentimes, big companies even outsource um, the vision um, or the creation of, of, of the vision, oftentimes to an advertising agency. I mean, okay, come on, uh, what can they do to, uh, to 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 improve the vision of the company? So when we are looking at um, companies like you know Amazon, Google, Tesla, there are still um, people at the top um, who st who who still work on their vision and who still improve. Um, um, 
their their leadership by thinking ahead. And oftentimes they have a very strong core value. So um, when you look at Google, for example, I mean their mission is not completed yet to 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 um, to make the information that the world creates accessible to everyone, you know, to the benefit of an individual or society or whatever. Yes, I mean, and 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 not to be evil, what they say. Um, um, actually, their success and and their um, innovation is their biggest problem at the moment because um, they are still striving for this very simple goal in in more and more um, aspects of our lives and society. Um, But still there, you know, a company like Google, for example, how rife for disruption is such a company by a new technology like the blockchain? Well, you know, if, if there will there will be always small startups who have a, a, a much higher dynamic than a big um, incumbent. And that is probably the biggest challenge for those who are, you know, those, same, those semi um, uh, incumbents that we've been talking about the last minute. Um, how you can uh, encourage creativity and also the strive for new opportunities from a um, uh, idealistic team uh, and well the the bigger you get and the older you are the more stuff you have to carry along i mean the more people you have to inform um, the more uh, departments you have um, it it gets it it gets pretty pretty crazy mm -hmm. but do you think google will still be around in five to ten years Yes, I would think so. As a, uh, yes, As a, um, Google and other companies. Uh, what I really like about um, some of the companies that have grown to such a size, like Amazon or Google, or probably even Tesla in the future, um, is that they are still uh, hanging on, uh, still still in there to change the world. And as long as you have this ambition. You, you will do that. You will not do succeed in every field. Um, but, um, um, and, and I, I say if, if, if you really, um, sum up, um, the things that they've done and the errors that they've made, I think it's still a positive outcome. Although there's quite a lot of criticism, but there might be companies that have the size of Google in 10 years from now that are not even founded yet. So, We are living in a time where you can, you have access to information, to people, to talent, and to money, and you can found a company within a few weeks, and you can be you, you can be a global player within two years, and you can be dominant in an industry within five years. That's never been the case, and so I believe that there will be companies besides Amazon, besides Google, besides Tesla that we don't even know their name yet. And they may eclipse what uh, Google currently is. Maybe. Um, I mean, when you really think about the blockchain and you, you would find a, um, a company that really solves, well, just one or two problems in, in transaction, whether it's with customers or among businesses or with uh, money or contracts or whatever, Uh, just imagine, I mean, while we are talking here every second, there, there are, there are hundred thousands per second that are still being, uh, processed in the old fashioned way. And if you can just grab a, you know, 20% market share from that and you can, you know, just, you know, if, if you'd earned just a tenth of a cent on every transaction, I mean, you would be richer than the biggest oil companies today. You also, think a lot about the future of work. And we've spoken quite a lot about that in the past. Today, already a lot of people are working in a decentralized way, in a sense, right? They work um, maybe in their own business, they have their own company, a one-man company sometimes, or they work, you know, from home, home office, in that kind of way. Um, but how do you see work change even more in the future? Yeah, it will, it will change even more. Yes. Um, and, and that is the reason why we are, we are exiting the industrial age. Um, the, the past 150 years were 
basically um, um, very much influenced by people working together with machines in the tact or in the in the um, um, in the way that machines would be able to to be more productive over time. And we have something like, you know, 40 hour work weeks. We have um, a measurement, how much time we are spending within a building, you know, for an employer or something. And that is changing quite dramatically right now. In the future, we will not pay for time, but we will pay for talent or for problem solving capability. And that, that also changes the metrics of, um, for example, payment. Uh, giving an example, I mean, I'm um, working as a futurist and I'm spending about six to eight hours a day um, just learning about the future, um, studying things that I, I didn't study uh, when I was young and uh, trying to get an, an, an new insights and, and connecting the dots, basically. Now, nobody pays me for that. Um, I have to be repaid in my projects. When somebody asks me, okay, how much do you cost? Um, I say, you know, um, I'm, I'm not being paid by the hour because, you know, the, the hourly wages could never pay these six to eight hours that I spent every day to, to gain that. So I would rather be paid by my problem solving or capabilities. So. Um, so we are actually telling our clients we are not calculating with uh, hourly wages or days that we are charging. We are calculating uh, what we call value-based pricing. So um, it is funny. If we are able to solve a problem in a day and somebody else needs 100 days to solve that problem, our day can be 100 times more expensive than the other ones, actually more expensive than a hundred times because we are faster. So, um, and that is a very big paradigm shift in how we are um, measuring work, how we are measuring value. And when we are looking at experts at the moment, uh, so when you are an expert in, in blockchain or in artificial intelligence, I mean, you can basically choose where and how you're gonna work and, and who for you're going to work. Um, and the other thing is that, um, we will have quite a lot of artificial intelligence, uh, that was going to do the routine work that is comprising right now to, to 70 to 80% of what we are working is answering emails, is doing our tax returns, is, um, you know, just routine stuff that can be done by artificial intelligence. So I believe in a few years from now, we will not be you know, talking about 40-hour work weeks. We will talk about um, weeks where we spend time learning, time helping others with our knowledge, uh, um, getting smarter, um, you know, everyone for its, for its own sake. But the change that uh, that work is experiencing experiencing right now is it has a big shakedown to the economies um, that we are experiencing today, and I believe that even when you look at um, developments in politics and dem and democracies um, over the last two or three years, you can already sense what is coming. Um, uh, people are scared of this change. The technology is moving faster than society can adapt. And that is one very, very important um, thing to watch um, over the next years, H how we are taking along the people with the capabilities that technology provides us. Mm -hmm. What are skills that people need to make the most of their talents in the future? Curiosity is one of the most important skills. Um, to be able to use their creativity and fantasy to imagine you know actually when you're when you're doing future research or you are planning something um it is very simple it is totally simple and it's something that is very common in our lives so for example if you're thinking about where do you want to spend christmas this year um 
you are coming up with pictures in your mind and trying to imagine what would be the most satisfying scenario for you. So you're imagining something that has not happened yet, that is in the future. And you start to plan and you're starting to communicate with others if they want to come along and you're renting a cabin in the, in, in, uh, on the hill and all these things. And, and that is common to us. But in business, if you're asking a business leader, if he's using fantasy to go to, 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 to come to a point where he says, Hey, this is great. He's not doing that. He's looking at numbers from the past. And um, that is quite sad because one of the unique things among humans is that they can create in their mind a state where they want to end up or where they want to go. And a valid picture of the future and the possibilities that we have helps us to find a way into the future. It doesn't help us to look at the data of the last 10 years because when we are looking at disruptive things. You cannot find the disruption in the past. You find it in the creativity when thinking about the future. And so I believe um, even in management and in, in executive search, we, would, should, we should probably look for other types of, of leadership and management to enhance this capability within companies to To, to 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 ensure their survival. Okay, let's hope that will uh, that will happen soon. And um, as always, when we speak, it's very fascinating. We could go down much deeper on any of these topics that you touched on, and hopefully, we can do this in the future as well. But for now, um, I really appreciate your giving us uh, this insight about what you think about blockchain technology and the future. And I really appreciate your taking time today. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. More info on our guests and our sponsors is in the show notes of this episode and on the podcast website, theblockchainandus.com. To help people find this podcast, it's important that you download, subscribe, and give it a top rating and review on iTunes or on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Manuel Staggers, and I thank you very much for listening.